Hello. So, audio. Um, I'm going to start off with another show of hands. Who knows what spatial audio is? Okay. So, for those other people that don't know, I'm going to give you a quick demonstration. <laughs> So what just happens? <laughs> what happens? The visual was disconnected from the audio. Exactly. So when we talk about VR, we say that sound is going to be the other 50% of it, right? right? Whereas with flat cinema, it's not such a big, a big of a deal. We're always at the last, you know, in the last five minutes, they're like, oh yeah, you make sure it sounds good. So uh, <laughs> hopefully this time it will be a little bit different and we get to you know, make sound a bigger part of the whole experience. Also want to let you know that this is the second time in 10 years that I've used Keynote. So I, maybe I had a little bit too much fun with it. But so we're going to start with specific challenges that we face to do audio for VR. So as the video is going to allow us to look everywhere, up, down, behind, we also need audio that will sound like it's coming from, from all directions. So we talk about horizontal, right, which is like the horizontal plane, front, back, left, right, vertical, up, down, and also we can hear distance, right? If is the sound close, is it far? Another challenge is it should track the viewing direction of the video and adjust the position of the sound, right, in real time. So each sound source needs a position that matches the visual, and the sound source needs to rotate counter to the viewing direction. So if I'm looking at a car and this car is in front, I will hear the car, the sound is in front of me. Now if I turn to my right, the, instead of with stereo headphones, right, where the whole mix would just go with your head, you want that car to stay there. So how do you do that? You, know, you turn right, so the sound needs to rotate left. So it's, a lot of people think the sound goes with the, you know, with the image, but it doesn't. It actually counter-rotates. Uh, we need to accommodate those sounds, those sounds that rotate, but also what they call non-diegetic, which is off-screen sound. So it might be a voiceover that you don't want that voiceover to follow you everywhere. You just want them like the voice of God. And music, uh, you know, if you have a music bed that you want to be static or an ambient sound that needs to be static. So there's a mix of elements that, you know, you need to worry about. Um, audio cues are important to redirect visual focus, right? We just saw that. Um, it keeps the viewer connected to the action, right? I mean, if you're looking up to the ceiling and the action is back there and you're not hearing anything, then, you know, you don't know what's going on. So you need to hear... Like the sound leads, a lot of times now in VR, the sound needs to lead if you're cutting, if you're editing, and you know, if you go from this viewpoint direction and the action is now behind you, you kind of need to lead it with, with sound. Uh, another challenge is capturing it, because you know, this on the left, we can't do that anymore, right? So what you see on the right is the new normal, right? The microphone needs to be in the nadir, what they call the nadir, because that gets patched a lot of times in post-production. So you won't see the camera, I mean the, the microphone, and we need to use those 3D microphones, what you see there, but we also need to use lav mics, because that is good for picking up ambience, but if people are far away, you're not really going to, it's not going to be, in, how do you say, in, intelli no. intelligent, no, intelligent, intelligible, intelligible, wow, that works. Um, so, and then the problem with that is with laughs, you're gonna have lots of rubbing noise, right? Like ideally, you want a boom mic, you want the guy there that is following. So with laughs, you have the rubbing noise, uh, there's gonna be a lot of background noise. Uh, you can have shotgun mics underneath the camera or you could sort of hide them, I guess, in certain places, you know, like where, where you don't see them. But, you know, normally you would like to adjust those depending on, you know, where the people are walking and now you can't do that, right? Because the camera, it looks everywhere. Like somebody said, like, if, 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 you're, if you're worried about, you know, if, if the camera's gonna see me, it's like, 
look at the camera, you know, can you see the camera? Then the camera is going to see you because it does look everywhere. Now, so we have all these three dimensions, right? Up, down, and we need to, most people are going to experience VR on headphones these days. So how do we get three dimensions into two little speakers? We do that through binaural rendering, which is, you know, simply put, the audio is recorded through microphones in your ear canal, and then basically played back to those same headphones slash microphones. Uh, we localize sounds in front of us based on level and time difference. So I can tell if it sounds louder from there, I know it's coming from there. Also, if it arrives earlier from there, because my head is still going to be in between. So if the sound is there, I'm going to hear it sooner out of this ear, and then it needs to go around the head, and then it arrives here. So that's how we deal with sound in front of us, right? And probably like 45 degrees, like each, each way. But VR, you know, it's, it's all around. So what are we going to do with the rest? You know, the, up, the height and, and the, the, the sound behind us. Um, then there's what, what, what they call the cocktail party effect, is that the human beings have, you know, we can have a bunch of people talking all at the same time, but you still are able to focus on, on one person. And you can even switch your focus, right? I'm talking to him, I, I, I hear him, and then somebody behind me is saying something, and I can focus on that, like eavesdropping, right? I mean, like, on that conversation. Um, distant sound sources sound more muffled, so that's how you can tell, you know, distance in sound because air dampens high frequencies. So what happens when there is no level or time difference, right? Like as you can see here, um, this is coming. This person doesn't know if it's front or back, right? Because it's, it's, it could be either or because there's no level or time difference. So how do we do that? Well, we turn, when we turn our head, we know, right? So how do we know that? It's because of your HRTF, which is the head-related transfer function, and it's your unique head, ear, and torso shape all combined together, and that, that basically determines the, the, the back and the up-down, I mean front-back and up-down localization. So <clears throat> it'll be different for everybody, for everybody, because everybody has a different head shape, different ear shape, and we were just trained, you know, as whatever, I guess, when we were babies and start, you just know, like, okay, when it sounds like this, it comes from behind. Um, and that localization, especially the back part, right, and the height is critical for, for, for you know, for VR to be truly immersive because that's what you really want to, you know, you, especially if you're leading, you know, your storyline and something is starting to happen behind you, you need to be able to locate it. So, um, that's, that's where we, so that's, that's where we have to be very careful because with sound currently, we use the, the, the playback mechanism, like let's say YouTube now is special audio support or any, you know, whatever the Oculus or it uses a generic kind of like an average head shape. So. That would be the same as using the Gear VR and it would not have a focus wheel and they're like, well, the average you know, focus of people is this. I mean, nobody would be able to, to see anything. They would be, well, what is this? I can't adjust the focus. So we still got some time to go. If it's 50% of, you know, of the experience, we need to, to step up a little bit on the audio side. But fortunately, having visual cues helps with some of the localization, right? Because if you're not, if you're seeing it or you're not seeing it, you can, I mean, you guys kind of knew that, you know, something was coming from there, right? All the, you know, so. Um, the other one is, it's very new medium, so no standards for sounds. I mean, for video, there's kind of standards, right? MP4, H.264, uh, most common codecs. But for all, I mean, look at all these different kind of, you know, requirements. So, obviously, we cannot, start creating eight mixes or seven mixes or nine mixes, you know, and start from scratch each time. It's like, oh, I want it on YouTube. Oh, let me start, you know, from scratch again. I mean, it would be great, you know, to get paid for all the time, but, but uh, you kind of need a mix that translates to all those different platforms. So what is the solution for that? The solution is one solution. I mean, I think the most that, it's going to be the winner in the, in the long run is ambisonics 
which has been around since the 70s. It was actually invented by a brilliant British mathematician for 3D playback over quad systems. In the old days, they had you know four speakers, left, right, you know, left, back, right, back, and and um, he wanted, they wanted to create height with that, right? So he figured out a way where the, where it's actually you can get any point in the spherical sound field with with ambisonics, which captures all around. So it's it's fully flexible. You can easily convert it to any playback format. So let's say I had an ambisonic mix and you have a 5.1 setup at home. You press a button and it'll be 5.1. You have a mono speaker, it'll translate to mono. There's no falling down, no phasing, you know, cancellation. Um, you can take your existing mono and stereo sound sources, let's say dialog or uh, stereo keyboard or and you can pan them into the Amazonic sound field. You can rotate the, the Amazonic mix and even transform it, zooming, all kinds of crazy stuff you can do with it. Uh, now, currently, we're still using first order Amazonics, which is a four channel uh, format, but soon we'll be able to have a higher order Amazonic format, which basically in it, 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 it increases the, your, your ability to localize sounds as it breaks up the audio in different frequency bands because we hear low frequency frequencies are all around us. We cannot really localize low frequencies with higher frequencies. We know exactly where they are. So breaking that up will increase that. So um, there is four channels in, in a first order ambisonic mix. You have your distance. I mean, this is all kind of roughly, I mean, I didn't want to go with any calculations because I don't understand them either. But, but uh, <laughs> So you have your distance, right? It's your W channel, which you can compare to a mono speaker. Then you have your front and back, which you can compare with like the quad or 5.1, right? Where you have rear speakers. So now suddenly you also have sound coming from the rear. Then you have your Y channel, which is your left, right, which is like a stereo setup. And you have your up, down, your Z channel, which is something that recently started happening, you know, in movie theaters with Dolby Atmos and another competitor called Aura, Aura 3D. I think I misspelled it. Um, that format, WXY, that WXYZ four channel audio file is called B format. And that's what all the ambisonic microphones output. So YouTube started supporting spatial audio about three months ago. And because it's YouTube, I mean, everybody watches YouTube. Uh, people have started to follow their lead and they're actually reordering those channels, which makes more sense to get it ready for higher order ambisonics. It's reordered WYZX. Um, another solution, apart from ambisonics, is object-based audio, which is, again, Dolby Atmos and DTX, DTSX. Dolby Atmos is coming out soon with a VR version of their cinema, you know, Dolby Atmos, which is, you know, speaker-based, right, with all different kinds of speakers, but rendered binaurally. So these are uh, proprietary solutions, right? You need company-specific encoding and decoding tools. Um, could be costly, right? If they say, like, well, I mean, you've been using our products now, now it's going to be, you know, a dollar per play. And you're like, well, it's, yeah, well, you want to hear it or you don't? Um, it was originally developed for, for movie theaters, so for loudspeakers, which it works really well for, because you can really kind of assign a speaker in each, I mean, a sound into each speaker, if, if you want it. Um, so each sound source becomes an object, and the, with panning metadata that is in a separate stream, so it's very bandwidth efficient. So you are able to stream spatial audio, you know, with a lot of, lot of different channels pretty efficiently. Um, it has superior localization compared to first order Amazonics, but it's less realistic because we don't really pinpoint sounds that much, right? I mean, you, you kind of hear always all around, right? I mean, I hear you talking, but I hear some reflections coming back. Um, and object-based audio doesn't really deal with that yet too well. Um, it can contain up to 128 on-screen objects that can rotate and up to eight channels of audio beds, right? Your stereo ambience, your stereo music, uh, could be four monos with like VOs or whatever sounds. So it kind of works like this, just to give, give you kind of an idea how it works in, in the theater, right? So that helicopter is just 
you see how it just goes from speakers to speakers, sort of, and that's what makes you, you know, that gives you the localization, you know, behind your head. Okay, a little bit about, about workflow. How do we deal with, uh, you know, spatial audio? Um, you can record it with these Amazonic microphones. Here's an example of three of them. What's really cool is that recently, this is a $160 uh, Zoom device that can now actually record Ambisonic first order, but no height, but horizontal, but you know, for $160, that's a really cool thing to have if you're, if you're into, you know, you can get a Rico Tita or $300 in this, and then you know, for $450, you're, you're ready to make, to make VR, right? I mean, that's what we all wanna do. Um, People always ask, well, what about binaural, you know, binaural recording? Binaural recording, it works for a static perspective, it works, but not for 360 because you cannot really rotate the original perspective, right? If I record with these ears like facing forward and I record this car, it will sound great, but imagine what is gonna happen, right? The sound is gonna stay there of this car and now I'm turning around. I would hear that car in real life very different, right? Because my ears will block the sound. But what you're doing is, is basically you're, you're, you're counter rotating that original sound, so it will, it will not work, right? Because it, my brain is tricked into believing that that's how in front sounds. You know, you know that sounds in the back sounds different than sounds in the front. Um, it cannot be, be encoded into the Amazonic sound field, so you're kind of limiting the usage. Uh, mixing and post-production. So I kind of want to explain a little bit, you know, how you how you kind of do it, people ask a lot, a lot, so you can kind of flatten the 360 video. Well, the 360 video starts out as flat, right? What they call it, where rectangular image. So you see that, and then let's say we have this keyboard player, right? So he's at zero degrees in the middle, like that, and zero horizontal. So instead of having our, our old fashioned stereo panel, where it's left, right, and now these panels, that's basically what they call azimuth, right? It's in the, in the horizontal plane and elevation, so you can set, you set that up, right? So you say, okay, the keyboard is at zero, zero, that's easy. Okay, so here, the next one is a quick video about how that works. I'm not sure, I mean, we tried with the sound system, uh, but uh, hopefully you can tell a little bit how, uh, how it works. get the idea, right? I mean, I'm not sure if you can, I mean, the speakers are probably too far apart. But. So here's some plugins and tools that you can use for, for, for mixing spatial audio. Um, we're also gonna put up these slides later on on, on SlideShare, right? And so if people, because I know there's a lot of info there, so if you wanna read it at home. Um, some future developments. <laughs> <laughs> MPEG H, which is <laughs> from the same people that make, you know, M well, that that you know, standardized MP4 and the MP3. It's MPEG H, which is coming out supposedly. I mean, we'll we'll find out, but they are working hard on it, and that's up to 128 channels of audio attached to a video file. So that's a lot of channels of audio. Um, so it would be great for higher order ambisonics, right? We, we talked about that a little bit. It increases the spatial accuracy, so better localization, and you also have basic, I mean, it's 128 channels, so you can have, you can have that channel rotate or not rotate, I mean, there's unlimited possibilities. The next one is the HRTF, which we've been talking about, but right now is all these generic HRTFs, which are basically like, you know, having no focus on your GVR. So little by little, it's coming where you can scan, and I'm sure that's gonna get easier to do, or they find some other way by sort of personalizing, so you scan the whole head and torso. And then they put it in a certain file form, a standardized file format. So now, instead of listening through that generic HRTF, you will actually listen to your own ears. 
And another one is wave field synthesis, which is a recreation of the exact acoustics and localization of sound sources with loudspeakers. So it's really like that, like that many speakers. There will be a ring of loudspeakers everywhere. And like the picture shows, it will be exactly the same as, as, as being there. But you know, it takes that is also it's still very costly, as you can imagine. So they're you know they're working on better methods for that. And that's it. Thank you. This is my email if anybody has any questions. So I'll start off with a producer is a person responsible for the financial and administrative aspects of a film. Or more simply put, producing is problem solving and planning. When producing VR, there are so many variables, like what camera systems to use. Um, cr for a crew, how large or small of a crew does one need? What roles are now essential and what roles are no longer even necessary? Do you only light with practical lighting or do you do an overhead softbox, which you then edit out and post? Um, you've heard just a lot about audio <laughs> moments ago, so I'm gonna skip right past that. Um, blocking is more essential than it's ever been and trickier thanks to the stitch lines and also the audience perspective. Uh, stitching, sharp or smooth? Do you use auto pano or nuke or unity or after effects? Like, uh, will your audience be watching on a closed platform or, or will they be watching on Facebook or YouTube or something that literally doesn't exist yet the day that you start shooting? Um, and lastly, <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> storytelling in the VR world, which has also been called uh, experience design. And in, in many ways, storytelling is like the greatest unknown right now. Most filmmaking techniques, techniques from shot sequences to composition to types of cuts no longer apply. How will the future of, uh, how will the future of motion media storytelling be told? Uh, and to top it off, decisions about almost every single one of these elements depends on multiple other elements. So the problem, how can one be responsible for planning and executing a project in a rapidly changing environment? To answer that, we look to the world of startups, and as Noah previously mentioned, Eric Ries's uh, book, The Lean Startup, and his definition of what a startup is. The startup is a human institution designed to deliver a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Um, specifically, we want to look at two of the principles of the Lean Startup. Principle number three, validated learning. Uh, by running experiments, one is able to learn what works and what doesn't. We should all be watching each other's work, copying the things that, that work well, and replacing or augment things that don't work. Uh, principle number five is build, measure, learn. At this stage of VR, the fundamental goal is to turn ideas into action, to measure how viewers respond and then learn whether to pivot or persevere. Um, so there are a few key planning points uh, that you should plan for in, in when you're uh, doing deep, uh, sorry. There are a few key things that you should plan for that are totally different in VR. First, if your director doesn't like fully understand how stitching work, and frankly, if they're not like actively running tests, you're in real trouble. All of the blocking relies on stitch lines. If you have an intricate or an emotionally charged moment that takes place in the middle of a stitch line, the only budget that will save you is the entire budget to reshoot from the beginning. <laughs> um, otherwise, there's a black hole which will suck up all of your money and only get it as good as it can, as good as it could be possible. Uh, secondly is like foreground elements. Shooting foreground elements in cameras is really tricky at the moment. Due to stitching issues with most VR cameras, one needs to choose to, to either match things that are close to the camera or far away. Um, usually your talent is going to be a little bit further away. And foreground elements, while they look great in flat video, but in camera, they'll prevent the action fr uh, beyond from matching. Uh, with current technology, it's best done by compositing, which increases costs, you know, uh, greatly. Uh, the same thing goes for green screen and plates. Um, and if you don't have a plan for state spatial audio, like you really should. Uh, audio will almost certainly be one of the most effective tools for guiding your audience through their narrative journey. Uh, in closing, the 
key takeaway that I have to give is building a team of reliable experimenters so you have many tests to, many tests to learn from. At this stage of VR, the experimenters are the experts. And the more you experiment in this space, the more we will all learn. Um, and that is it. <laughs>